I'm very pleased to welcome a famous American architect, Stephen Hall, who will give us today an introductory lecture, which is called Air, Light, Green Space Post-COVID. Uh, actually, we approached Stephen for two reasons. One, we love his architecture. And second is that Stephen Hall won an architectural competition for a concert hall in Ostrava, uh, which is a university town in the east of the Czech Republic. Uh, and it's one of the largest recent architectural events that happened here in, in our country. So we felt it might be a good idea if we would invite Stephen and he could share his thoughts with us and with you. Uh, obviously, the first plan was that he will come in person. Uh, he promised that last year, but due to the obvious reasons, uh, he was unable to come, but we are still very much honored that he ac accepted our invitation, even though he cannot be here in person. So what we actually did is that we, uh, to avoid some technical problems, I am sure that you all know what can happen during an online lecture. Uh, so we pre-recorded his, uh, his lecture for you. Uh, and after that, uh, Stephen will join us uh, live for, uh, for a Q&A session. Uh, so you can ask him any question you want, uh, and not only you here in, in, in the auditorium, but also you who are watching us over, uh, over your computer. Uh, we have a thing which is called Slido. Uh, I saw it for the first time yesterday, but it works perfectly. It's very nice principle. Uh, if you use this QR code, which you can find on the website of the conference or also on the Facebook page, you can, through this app, you, uh, you can ask questions and I'll see them here on my iPad and I'll ask uh, the questions uh, uh, to Stephen for you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Hall, and I'll ask the technicians if they can play the lecture. Thank you. air, light, and green space post-COVID architecture, which I've given a number of times. So this is organized in these different sections, embrace green space and landscape, maximize fresh air and natural light, open circulation and social space, outside simulcast, distance seating, and ecological integration. So I basically, I'm going through a few buildings these, these issues are things that I've been interested in for a long time. In fact, I gave a series of lectures called Pro Kyoto back in 2001, 20 years ago, it's hard to believe, when, when Bush would not sign the Kyoto Protocol. Now we're really lucky that Biden is going to re reintroduce climate as one of the main issues that we have to face. But during that lecture, I had a chart which I tried to position architecture today. And I had three columns. The first two columns were done by Colin Rowe, where he divided classic and modern architecture into these two, two terms. And I added the right-hand column for the 21st century. And it's funny, this is 20 years ago, but I think these, these terms still apply. For example, classic is absolute, modern is relative, 21st century is interactive. Classic is fixed. Modern is stable. 21st century is dynamic. Classic is physical metaphysical. Modern is physical real. 21st century is virtual real. And I won't read the whole thing, but that I think what's really interesting about kind of meditating and trying to give talks and thinking about architecture is if the ideas hold over 20 years, this building just opened. In fact, because of COVID, we're going to have another opening in September. It's the Winter Visual Arts Center in Franklin and Marshall College, a small campus in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this was actually from the interview. I, I, I made a couple sketches. 
And I said, you know, what's really interesting is Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders, this is a very old uh, college, and Marshall, a man of law, was heavy and Franklin was light, flying his kite for electricity. And that was a nice, nice beginning, but I thought it's a little bit too light. It doesn't have enough depth and relation to exactly the site. So this notion of a kite sitting on some heavy elements took a much more intelligent form when I started to analyze the trees. The trees are the oldest, oldest thing on this campus. Some are 300 years old and they're four feet in diameter. So I took the diameters of the trees and made the, the whole building be a series of concave elements. So this whole kite uh, elevated above, which, you can, uh, which allows you to see the Buchanan Park, took on another dimension. There you see a sketch from 2016, where you can see through to the park beyond. And you can see that the, the, the tectonics, I do everything on these little five by seven watercolor pads. Here was the idea of using wood, structural wood and exposing it in the, in the, in the studios. This is a school of art, you know, graphic design, painting, sculpture, and art theory. And there you see the, uh, uh, the, the actual wood that they used, uh, uh, the Amish from Lancaster, Pennsylvania used uh, uh, the, this Douglas fir, TNG was structural and it's exposed. So the whole building is kind of built like it was drawn in the sketch pads. There you see the program, the drawing studio, the, the, the woodworking studio, design studio, the auditorium, which also has a, a real film projection booth, painting studio, printmaking studio. And instead of corridors, we have these big pivot doors and a common, a commons that unites the whole school and, and people can you know, enjoy each other's work. There you can see the section where the, the structure is like a box kite sitting on these concrete boxes. There's an actual sketch in the red line uh, it is the sort of uh, truss that allows the, the, the steel structure that's the main thing of the, the top part to be very light because of the, the, the very huge um, depth of the truss section. And there it is under construction. Uh, 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 the building was quite economic because of the nature of this steel lattice. And there it is finished, a trotso ground concrete floor, the, the view to Buchanan Park, and then the, the new campus uh, quadrangle for art on the other side, and then the stairs up to the commons and all the studios. And the idea of and circulation being open and, the, and not requiring elevators, so that you can really reach every part of the building without having to use an elevator. And there's the auditorium, and the underside is a powder coat blue, reflecting in the, in the uh, pond that collects all the campus rainwater. And the building glows at night. There you can feel the way the tree on the right-hand side is in, in, in influencing the geometry of the building. And that is a pool that, this is the low point of campus. So that's groundwater retention. Uh, retention. So that's a rainwater recycling pool also acts as a, as a kind of reflecting pool of the building. In Kansas City in 2007, we opened the Nelson Atkins Museum Extension. There you see the original building, a 1933 neoclassical stone building. And they have an enormous collection of, of Oriental art. And I had this inspiration from this Chinese painting from the 11th century about the integration merging landscape and architecture. And here you can feel the way the new building really integrates this landscape. I feel the time we're facing now, landscape becomes incredibly important. In fact, you could even say that this sort of post-COVID and climate change period puts landscape at the top of our list of ways to begin thinking about what we're going to build. And here, the landscape is integrated one-to-one -one with the new addition. Down, uh, it, this is one of the watercolors from the competition where you can look out on the existing sculpture garden. This is a Noguchi. They have the largest collection of Noguchi pieces in outside of the Noguchi Museum. And there's the, there's the realization of that same space. 
with people outside in the sculpture garden. So this is, this is the existing building, a big neoclassical uh, pile. And then our, our new addition meanders down the landscape and, and therefore it's all underground connected. And then these lenses form these other sculpture gardens between. And so you see the section lying down, it's some um, 850 feet long. I remember the competition when I, when I mentioned uh, when I was explaining it, and this was a jury, that, which was a fantastic jury, Ada Louise Huxtable, Jay Carter Brown, the director of the National Gallery, um, John Gaunt, Mark Wilson, the director of the museum. And Ada Louise said to me, Stephen, don't you think this building is rather long, rather too long? And I said, have you been to the Louisiana Museum in Denmark? Oh, yes. I said, that's a beautiful integration of landscape and architecture, and it's longer than our proposal. Anyway, we won the competition um, unanimously, and the building now is celebrated 10 years already, and great outdoor space. Um, this just opened uh, the year before the pandemic, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, a similar idea where landscape maybe two thirds of the design of the, of the extension. And this was also a competition. We were up against Dilda Scafidio, uh, Richard Martin, many, many architects, each of which did a kind of object addition to that Edward Durrell Stone building there in the distance, which is the largest performing arts center in America. They have events 360 days a year. And it's a living memorial for JFK, so remember, I mean, this is an important place in Washington. And Jefferson Memorial, of course, uh, we all know with, with the wonderful Japanese flowering trees on the way up. Lincoln Memorial, a place of famous uh, meeting and protest along the mall. But the Kennedy Center is a big box. It's a living memorial. So our building is trying in a way to integrate that with landscape and with connections to the other memorials. So there were three, three pavilions that they're all connected below grade. This ends up being the largest green roof in, the, in, the, in, in Washington, D.C. after it's built. And there you can see a, a grove of 35 ginkgo trees uh, in, the, the, in honor of JFK, the 35th president. And the ginkgo tree um, turns yellow with the beautiful golden leaves right around the 22nd of November when he was assassinated. And you see these green uh, uh, gathering areas. The, the, the river pavilion has a, a, a large pond and everything is connected below grade. But, but integrating the landscape first uh, with the original co competition design. I worked as a landscape architect for Lawrence Halpern in San Francisco for three years. So in, in, at a certain point in my life, I also felt I should be a landscape architect. I studied under Richard Hagg at the University of Washington. He always said to me, be the site, to really understand the site. And here's the river pavilion on the right, the, the Glissando pavilion in the distance, the water gardens, what we did, the, the fountains with the five bronze spouts. And uh, it's just a space of great uh, activity now during the COVID. We're all outside here and they even worked, they even had uh, snowboarding events in the, in the winter. There's the river pavilion. And you can see the Lincoln Memorial in the distance there. And this big uh, uh, area on the right is a simulcast screen. So it allows you to project with a 50, 000, two 20,000 lumen projectors exactly what's going on in the opera house. So instead of paying $250 a seat, you can see it for free. And that's my daughter at the opening walking around. There's events. This was before COVID. Um, and now this is COVID time, fall 2020. People are socially distanced, but they have concerts coming out of the River Pavilion. And of course, this is a kind of family bubble sitting on a, on a, a blanket there. And more and more, I could just show all the different events that have been going on um, all, the, all the time that the, the main center, because uh, indoor activities are, are closed, has been closed. But this, this garden that we made, this sort of 
merging of landscape and architecture has proved to be a really important place. And uh, I see that, that in the future, designing landscapes integrated into our urban areas are very important. Maximizing fresh air and natural light, something I've done from the beginning of my work, I believe profoundly in, in natural light is a very important, in fact, one person asked one time, what is your favorite material? And I said, light. And here's the, the doctorate's building in, at the University of Bogota, which is all open air. <clears throat> so because it's always 70 degrees there because of the 8,000 uh, foot elevation, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a strange town that way. It's a, it's, so what it allows you to do in an academic building is really walk inside and outside without divisions. So we thought a, a concept would be inside out and upside down. So the whole building would just kind of unfold itself, making a big portal and forming a quadrangle. And this, you know, when you have a concept, then I, you, you know, we, we try to study and model form, what does that mean? And I'm, this lecture is not about that, but this is central to our work as architects, the spatial energy that's equivalent to an idea. There you see the layout of these classrooms that can be all accessed out on outside walkways. Nobody has to ever be inside and no one ever needs to use an elevator. So it's really an open air project. And it has PV cells to supply all the electricity. It has recycling of the rainwater, natural ventilation to all spaces. All of our projects strive for that. And that's that big open portal, which I'll talk about in a a moment and a cafe, a roof cafe at the other end of the axis of that portal. The building is ready to be built. All the working drawings are done, but we've had a delay due to some political mm, mm, machinations at the top of the university, and hopefully that will change. Thinking about housing, I go all the way back to 1991. My first, actually my first uh, block of housing of any consequence, void space, hinge space housing in Fukuoka. And here there are 30 apartments and they're all accessed from outside walkways. So you never have to really walk inside. And they, they revolve around four water gardens. And they interlock like a Japanese puzzle. Every apartment is different. There you see one of the walkways on the right hand side and the water gardens. This is a, was a very successful project. And I was next door to Rem Cool House, uh, uh, Mark Mack of Christian Poulsen Park. And our building was so successful, I was invited to do another block of housing in Japan right after that. And this, is, uh, this, this building will open uh, this year. The, the Rubenstein uh, uh, Commons for the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton a very important place in Princeton where Einstein and in fact did the last 10 years of his work. So our concept was the intertwining of, of nature and science and mathematics, humanity and the arts. So these water gardens are all intertwined with the landscape and the spaces of the building. And the notion of light and how it comes into the building changes. So you have all these different aspects of natural light. And that's a sketch from the competition period, 12, 12, 15. You see this notion of the building is so narrow at one point, you can see the water garden on, on the opposite side while looking at the water garden on this side. And there's the final plan. You see the cafe and conference rooms a bar, living room. This is where a lot of uh, important studies and conferences would take place, um, such as the work that's going on with CRISPR today, uh, Jennifer Daldena. Uh, I'm working on, on, on a couple of projects that have to do with, with genomics and, 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 the, and the new knowledge of CRISPR. Many different activities occur at this Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, very inter interesting space. It's basically a one-story building that you can walk through with a mezzanine. That's a computer drawing of the interior studies 
Nowadays, of course, uh, we have such capacity in our computer that you can practically render the thing to be built, but that's not built yet. It's the glass had been delayed by COVID uh, backup of material deliveries. Anyway, it will be a very important place. This is Einstein Drive, the approach. That's the original building in the distance with the clock tower on it. We're using the same copper roofs, the same vertigrees copper roofs as the original 1930 full building um, where Einstein's office was. Open circulation and social space. This is the University of Iowa where the Visual Arts Building in Iowa City was a, a building about multiple centers of life. The building is 300 feet uh, square, so it's quite a large building. And we really wanted to bring natural light and ventilation to every part of it. So we carved it out in these seven uh, voids. And there you can see how they interact with art spaces, uh, uh, classrooms, um, a, a program similar to the Winter Arts Building with printmaking, painting, sculpture. And the building negotiates two, two elevations in the campus. So you can enter at this upper level and walk out the other side. And you basically, you're connecting uh, to the dormitory section of campus and to the campus proper. So this is, this is a kind of walkway that goes through the building and many people on the whole campus take this walkway. So that allows uh, inter inter interaction with the art school and they can stop and look at the galleries, enjoy what the students are doing. Multiple centers of light, that was the concept. But how was I gonna activate that? And that was by what I called laminar, uh, a laminar just a juxtaposition in the section where the section doesn't align at these places. And at each of these multiple centers, there's a, there's a little a lounge where you can sit on your laptop and work. And there you can see the relation of that building, the new building to our original building um, in 2007, the Iowa College of Art, Art West. So this was a, a big challenge to build next to a building that you had done 10 years ago. In London in 2017, we opened the Maggie Center, a place for people with terminal cancer. The Maggie's concept was initiated by Charles Jenks many years ago. And now there's over 12 of these little buildings where, where architecture is used as a kind of, let's say, joy of life aspect for these people that come there and have a place to meet each other. The concept was a, a thing within a thing within a thing a sort of bamboo inner layer, a structure of very soothing natural bamboo, a kind of concrete hand, which is the structure, and outside, a, a musical score, a, 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 a kind of noom notation. Next to this building, and at the name of the area, St. Barth, is the oldest, one of the oldest cathedrals in the center of London, so old that it, it dates back to the time of monks using uh, noom notation instead of a, a normal musical no, notation. And so I looked at some of those and found these interesting colors and took this idea to give this building a kind of musical concern by inserting these color elements in the Okalux, which I'll show you in a moment. And the building is all uh, 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 traversed in a very simple bamboo stair. So you don't have to use the elevator and has a terrace on the top. There you see the natural bamboo. And there you can see these noom notation embedded between the inner and outer insulation of the Okalux. Something we invented, really, it's a kind of new, new stained glass because that, that fabric of color is very easily inserted in the German factory that produces this stuff. So they could do, they could follow all my strange shapes and do anything and then just, just produce this. And what's interesting is during the daytime like this, it glows from the light from the outside and to the inside. And then in the nighttime, it glows from the inside to the outside. There you see the St. Bart Hospital 
the oldest hospital in the United Kingdom, uh, the courtyard. Opening in 2019 was also the Hunters Point Library in Queens. You could, there's, there's the Pepsi Cola sign on the left and the, 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 some a, a beautiful gantry park on the right and all these condominiums. So this service is the whole Queens community, Hunters Point Community Library. And we had the idea that the building should be vertical. It could have been horizontal. It could have been one floor, but we said, no, it should be vertical. It should have a view of Manhattan. And when you go up these stairs, there's a balance between the computer and the book. Coming into the building, you look up and you see the bookshelves, but behind along each side is a computer desk where you can be on your laptop. So the building then frees up the site for a park on either side. And there's a, a state parks building along the edge, a one story building that forms the edge of that garden. So the building is a concrete building, uh, structure is on the outside, there's no columns. So the building is inscribed with the circulation going up the stairs, or you can read that coming on the east elevation, you can read that there's a children's section, an adult section and a teen section, three main sections of the building. And there's, I think that was opening day in 2019. So that, that, there's no curtain wall, that's just silver stain on concrete. And there's that moment where you see the books, but the computer desks are behind. And that's the children's library with an incredible view of the Empire State Building. And in fact, you can see Lou Kahn's FDR Memorial from there. And there's just the playful uh, uh, use of bamboo in its natural form. That's the most, one of the most ecological materials you can use. And at night, it kind of glows like a little beacon. This is the Glassell School of Art, opened in 2018. And there was our competition uh, drawing, which was a key because this was a competition where there was, a, there was an art building right here of 40,000 square feet. And, the, and this site belonged to the church. In order to move the parking from this site, they were gonna build a parking garage behind this existing building. And that would be the first thing they would do is build a seven story parking garage. Well, my competitors, Tom Main and Snohetta actually produced designs, you know, with whatever kind of, uh, you know, kind of facade work or whatever. They, they did designs with seven story parking garages. I made this drawing and I said, you shouldn't do that. What you should do is take the courage to build a new glacelle. 40,000 square feet is not big enough. Make an 80,000 square foot school. And by the way, your mission in the beginning in 1920s was education for art. So you would, you would underline that. But by doing that, you could put the parking on a layer underground and not have any parking above ground. And you would also, you would also double, this is a Noguchi sculpture garden, one of the great works of Noguchi that he's ever done. And it's got great, it has Matisse's back, so you've got to go there. I mean, this is a must visit, this sculpture garden. But I said, when you do this, you will double the size of your sculpture garden and it'll be just a little bit bigger than Dallas. And uh, I think that was, that was the clincher. I got a unanimous vote that we won the competition. There you see the complex now where there's the, the Cullen Sculpture Garden by Noguchi. There's our 2018 glass cell school, very simple building. There's the new section of the sculpture garden. And this building just opened in November, the, the, the kinder building. This is all precast concrete uh, done in Waco, Texas and, and brought in on trucks. And these elements that you're looking at here are the structural elements that support these floors. So this, this floor cannot be poured until these precast, these enormous precast pieces are put in place. And I wanted operable windows, natural air in all the studios. So that's what these little squares are. These are all operable windows for the stu studios for the art. And the whole building kind of comes, you enter it at the corner and then there's a big a sort of Piranesi like uh, condition of stairs that really become the center of this space and 
now I'm very happy to say that there have been a number of rap uh, performances performed in this space. You can Google it and you will see enormously interesting dancing going on on these blocks and up and down these stairs. Just because this, also there's been weddings here already. So it's a, it's a very interesting school of architecture with one main kind of condition at the knuckle at the, at the corner. And there you see that Chiyida sculpture, one of the first Chiyida sculptures that they acquired many years ago. And I was so lucky that they moved this sculpture to the plaza, that's the new plaza on, on the sculpture plaza for our Glacelle building. And you can almost feel the relation. It's also related to the walls that Noguchi built in the Cullen Sculpture Garden. So there's the whole complex now. Um, there's the original 1929 stone building, the Mies van der Rohe, the only museum in America by Mies. The only time he ever used a curve, but this is the nature of that street. So we answer Mies's curve with a curve here. That's a Moneo building from the year 2000. This is connected by a James Terrell tunnel. We are connected by our Olafur Eliasson tunnel, a beautiful tunnel I'll show you in a minute. That was the competition model. You see, I didn't know what this building would be. I was taking a chance at that point, and, and, you know, because we're radically saying they had to tear this building down and build this new. So at this point, uh, when we won, then I suddenly I had two buildings to do, which was a, was a great honor. And then we finished the Kinder Building, opened in November. And this is a great museum. Uh, it has incredible collection of art. And the whole building is, you know, made out of, well, the first idea was the big Texas sky, the clouds that push down on concave openings and allow what I call a luminous canopy, this na the, the natural light and how it can animate the studios. You know, I, I've been to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth uh, three times, and I love the work of Lucan, and I, I love this silverly, silvery light there. But in a way, I couldn't copy anything like that, but I wanted to work with light and make it somehow dissolve as it moves across. And then the idea of an, of an art museum is also always about circulation. How can you really find a way to circulate so that you can close certain galleries while they're being installed, that you never backtrack into dead ends and have to walk back through another gallery to get out, that you have you know, a relief, like these seven gardens around the outside, give what a, a relief from museum fatigue. So I'm, you know, there, there's just sections of the building, it's a complicated uh, section, but you can see those the sort of luminous canopy at the top. And this is the tunnel connecting the Glacell School to our, our new um, uh, uh, kinder building. And we made all the sculptural shapes in the tunnel. And then all of Eliasson came in and put this strange light so it, the whole thing becomes an artwork. And the director, Gary Tintero, was saving this mobile by, by uh, Calder. And I never knew it, that this was going to happen. But this is a, what, one of the only white mo mobiles that Calder did. And he hung it right in the center of the space. So it really is fantastic. It animates the this, this central area of, of all the galleries with this magnificent work by Calder. And you're looking up, you'll see the luminous canopy. And there it breaks open at the top floor. This is during COVID time, you can see because they have a mask on. It's an interesting moment that we're living in. You know, we'll always be able to tell when it was happening, when whatever it is that was photographed that was happening because all the people are wearing masks. There you see some luminous canopy. That's also the source of the artificial light. And that was not easy. Hervé de Scott of Observatoire worked years to get the light balance to be perfect. And on the street level, those big uh, live oaks native to Houston, we saved all of them. We moved the building back. We, made, we shrunk the plan to save all the live oak trees and then you can have a kind of view out from the ground. This is a ground floor sculpture gallery. This is a competition model. And that was when I was thinking about what I call a cold jacket. That is hollow tubes 
that when the sun hits them, the hot air would rise like the chimney effect, and they would bring light into the mid-level galleries. And I'm very excited to say that we achieved it, but it was not easy. It was really hard. And uh, to make a long story short, we, you know, there was nobody in America that could make these big 18 inch glass tubes that are like 25 feet high. They, they couldn't be made. And with that. the people in Spain that could make them, uh, it would cost too much. And Qian glass in China could make them and it was on budget. And so then the nerve was, would, the, would, they, would they be all right? And here we are at that moment of the full-size mock. I always require full-size mock-ups on every project so we can test all the things, all the tectonics, the way materials, details, and everything comes together. But here's the cold jacket and it works and the tubes work. And that was like a wonderful moment. So when you go there, you're gonna experience something that's never been done before. And uh, if you're, young architects just graduating, I wouldn't try this. I wouldn't try this right away. I've been working on architecture for 40 years. And I think if I would have been too young when I tried doing something like this, they would have probably fired me or whatever, something would have happened. But we did it and we were very proud of it. And it's really spectacular at night and during the day it changes. It changes so many different ways, uh, the weather, the nighttime, and it's working as a cold jacket. The hot air rises across the face of the building. There's a view from Noguchi's sculpture garden. And you can see those, those tilted walls that Noguchi built in 1980 and how we picked those up on the Glacelle building to the left. And there's the building at night and the whole campus, really. You can see the Mies van der Rohe building on the right the way he always put those standing beams on the roof, the, the Glacel on the left and the Kinder building and the Gucci sculpture garden in the center. And the, and the glow is spectacular at night. Outside simulcast, distance seating and seats in auditorium is something that we're, we're doing. I talked to you about that, that we can have a simulcast and people can sit outside at, at any distance and watch what's going on in the opera house at the Kennedy Center. There you see um, actual, this activity was taking, taken before, before COVID, um, the summer that it opened. And we have the similar thing at, in proposed in Bogota where the auditorium has a simulcast that happens in this big uh, portico. So we activate this loggia shape. Ecological integration, which is my last topic, we always, take it to the extreme. And here we had the largest geothermal heating and cooling installation in China at the time. And, and this, is a, this is a building which is about, a, 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 about living, working, and recreating in, in the same section of the city. So it, it, it really counters the problem of Beijing where everybody's in their car and moving back and forth and stuck traffic all the time. Here you can live, you can work and recreate everything. And there you see that the geothermal array here was had never been tried before. It's 100 meters deep. The wells are 10 meters on center. They thought it wouldn't work, but the, the client here was this, was, this was right before the Olympics, the Olympics in 2008. So this was around 2002 when they took the chance to put in these wells and it's working perfectly, heating and cooling 740 apartments, the largest geothermal array in Beijing at the time. And this water here also is all recycled water. The entire, all these apartments have um, uh, gray water recycling that comes to a large zapping tank, an ultraviolet zapping tank. So that whole pond water is perfect and it doesn't smell. The ducks love it, the, the turtles love it. It stays there in the winter, it freezes. Some people can ice skate there. So this water feature at the center of this whole complex become something both ecological and enjoyable as a, as a work in landscape. We won the competition for the horizontal skyscraper in Shenzhen and that opened in 2009. And there we, we turned the entire site into a tropical landscape and gave it back to the city of Shenzhen, open to the public and elevated the entire building in floating in the air on a 
And this was a diagram for the competition. The, the, it sits right on the ocean in Shenzhen. You can see the ocean. And you know, the, there's, in the future, there will be rising tides and flooding. But ocean views are really spectacular. So I said, instead of just making a, a building that kind of rises up to the 35 meters, let's put the whole building up there. 35 meters, you get ocean views. You return the landscape to the city. And also, if there's ever flooding and hurricanes things, you'll be free of it up in the air. And also, it's a, a, a building about feng shui, you know, wind and water. For all the Oriental people, you, they, they probably know that you have your back, your north back to the mountains, and you're embracing arms to the south and to water. So this building is a perfect example, a giant example of feng shui. And that was the that was the model where we said the building ride rides over the landscape and the landscape is given back to the city. And one of the reasons I think that we won, again, I, I said, look, your site is 60,000 square meters. We're raising this above the site. So you're gonna keep that as landscape and we're gonna put a green roof on top, which is 15,000 square meters. So building this way, you actually increase the green landscape to 75,000 square meters. And I made the landscape my uh, learning from uh, Carl Burley Marx as a kind of painting with different types of vegetation in different areas and different colors. And of course, the another aspect is the wind blows through. This is a this is a tropical climate in Shenzhen, China, and the wind blows through here and it creates a magnificent air and shade. Shade is really something positive. And the building is so up in the air so far that plants grow under it. So it's not, it's not a, a, a problem in terms of, you would never build a building like this in New York City, that's for sure. But, but here in Shenzhen, where you have this tropical landscape, it becomes something quite positive. All, all operable windows, you can see them open up on the right, um, geothermally heated and cooled and, and uh, solar panels on the roof. This is also, this was the first uh, platinum green building in South China. And they're very proud of that. The Vanke International Company is very proud of that. And these are analysis by Matthias Schuler, my consultant always on all our green aspects of our buildings. He analyzes every, every aspect. I think that every facade is treated differently because of the different sun angles. That's some of the planting below. We made special louvers that were the same thickness of palm frond uh, leaves. And they, in, in some cases they operate. So these are all custom louvers. In some cases they operate. And of course, solar um, power on the roof. And inside all bamboo, wonderful material. There's a company that we work with that that could make any shape that we wanted. And I came up with this sort of bamboo forest, um, digitally cut screens that can be slid. And so you can see out or slow it. They're, here they're closed. So they, they create shade. And at night, the, the structural columns that hold the building up became light fixtures. But that wasn't the only thing they do. There's concrete inside there, of course. And there's a cable stay system that's, it's tension cables holding, but there are no trusses in this building. But the problem is where all the plumbing coming down then. So I brought it down on the outside of the concrete and I put a, a sandblasted glass cover on clips. So you can access the plumbing and get to the, all the services <clears throat> directly behind this. And then we put lights in there and they became, they became the kind of nighttime lighting. That's my lecture, um, uh, which, I, I think these points are, I call it post COVID, but in a certain sense, they're, they're good for, for, for a long time. And they, they're something we've been working with. And I, I feel pretty strongly that, that they're a positive thing. Stephen Hall. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, in a second, we'll try to connect with Stephen live. So as I said before, uh, you can ask him questions. I hope you are prepared. Uh, I have 
already some questions here in the app about, of course, you can ask live and I have a skillful assistant there on the right side. So if you raise your hand, he'll run to you and uh, you can ask the question yourself. So let's try to connect with Steven. Hello, everyone. Hello, Steven. How are you? Very good, very good. And I'm very excited to show a few images here about our project in Ostrava. We have the slides ready for you. It's a I big just, pity I, you cannot be here. You should see the audience. It's the first time after a year and a half when we met here like this because of you. So, uh, uh, well, it's an, honor. it's an honor to be here. Uh, we have your slides. So, so I, 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 in this lecture, which is a different topic, I did not put in my most exciting upcoming project, which is the Ostrava Concert Hall. And I just show four images here. Can we, you want the next slide, I guess. Yeah. And uh, this was an international competition, which was in two rounds. And we were very, very enthusiastic about it because I love the, the connection of music and architecture. And I love, I love being in Prague. I, I was in Prague for my first time in 2004 and my good friend, John Hayduck always said, Stephen, you must go to Prague. And uh, now we had this chance in uh, 2016. And now I have, uh, we have another image. Do we have another image? We're in the middle of design development. That was a concept because the problem was the, uh, the garden side is the quiet side and the original building needs to be respected. And the, the promenade side is on the front. So I thought, let's enter on the promenade side, jump over the building, don't touch it, and, and make this about the garden side. And that was a concept sketch. My wife is here in Greece with me, Demetra Zakrelia, and she said, that's a winning idea. <laughs> and now we're in design development. Can we have the next slide? So it's all going very well. Everybody's very happy. Uh, the, the, the people in the, in the Anacek Orchestra, uh, everyone is very excited about it. And I, can we have the next slide? There's the entrance side on the promenade. And we're working now with the Nagata Acoustics. This, the idea of the building is a perfect acoustic instrument in its case. Anyway. I have the announcement tonight that is the ground, we're in design development, the many drawings, and the groundbreaking will be on the 22nd of September, uh, 2022. And Olaf Schmidt is running the project and he sent me that email from New York in a, about a, 15 minutes ago. So we just found out about this. And Martin Kopik is from Italy. He's uh, our, Prague uh, architect in collaboration, and he worked in my office for several years before. So we we were, we entered the competition together. So we have definitely a real Prague uh, speaking and connection with this collaborative team. It's a great team. Everyone is loving it, and we're very excited to make this announcement that this groundbreaking is coming up in uh, September 2022. That's great news. Congratulations. Uh, I hope we will be able to see you in Prague then. Yes, yes. Before, because I'm hoping to come in October uh, to make some uh, lecture on the building uh, more in detail in October, because my um, exhibition will be in, in Ostrava. Then you should come to our school because you will see a sculpture which our students made uh, according to a sketch of John Hayduk. So uh, you should definitely come and see it. Uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, I have the first one written by hand by our EAE president. So if I may, uh, the question is, 
What is your opinion the role of the architect will be in 10 years from now, given the environmental urgent issues we are facing today? Well, I believe architecture must be the optimistic discipline of all of the sciences. My, I have a son that's just one year old. So I'm interested in what is the life in 2050. And I believe that we, with our technological ingenuity and our architectural creativity can overcome a lot of negative things. We can make ecological works. We can do recycling works. We can do zero energy works. We can get rid of fossil fuels. So I, I feel with human ingenuity, as long as politics doesn't block us, we can be much more happy in 2050 than we are today. Thank you. How about the audience? Any questions? Don't hesitate to ask. It's your uh, unique opportunity. So before you think about another question, I have some questions from our audience who, who is watching us over the internet. Uh, the, one, the first one, a very nice one, I think, is what is the first thing that we should teach to a student of architecture? That you must go to the buildings and experiencing them buildings in the flesh. I grew up uh, in Seattle. I never really understood what is architecture because there wasn't any. <laughs> Maybe the Space Needle. <laughs> But then in 1970, I became a student in Rome and I lived behind the Pantheon. And I went to the Pantheon almost every morning to see the light. And I lived in Rome for almost a year. And I, I really understood the depth and the amazing emotional power of architecture. So if you want to be a student of architecture, you can't just look at the computer screen. You have to go and experience these buildings in the flesh. And you will see the material, the detail, the light, the energy, and the history. And that's, that's the essence of being a student of architecture. It's not something you can do in the computer. Well, if you allow me, we, before you come, we will engrave these words somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will sign them Stephen Hall, of course. Uh, another question from the audience. Oh, there's one gentleman in gray. Uh, hello, Mr. Hall. Uh, my name is Karol Smekal. I'm from CTU in Prague. And uh, I was very happy to hear about the green architecture, about the green uh, uh, environment. And uh, however, however about, uh, about interior green. Because what I saw in your architecture, everything was outside. Windows were big, of course, but uh, the interior seems to be like uh, con too concrete. What do you think about the future of thinking this way to allow the green to be with us in architecture? I believe that the natural landscape m must be restored in every way. And we should try to build our our new human environments in more dense pack ways and allow the green landscape to be restored. And the reason for this also is biodiversity. The animals and the birds and all the different living things need those biodiversity places. So it's not about just the human thought about having some potted plants in your living room. It's about the whole earth. And we must preserve as much of the natural landscape as possible to have the biodiversity. You know, we are at the moment uh, experiencing uh, one, and I don't know what the ratio is, but there's a, a huge extinction of species that's going on right now because of human uh, destruction of habitat. So to create Architecture means also to have a moral responsibility to preserve the natural habitat 
and increase the biodiversity and not kill it off. So when you talk about interiors, I don't know what you're saying. Are you talking about some plants inside of a, a bedroom? That's not the issue. The issue is a global issue and it's an international issue. And we, we need to come together as humanity and think about it. I think I've been reading the great Roman uh, philosophers from Stoke. That's the reason why we pre-recorded the lecture. And uh, you hear us? Yes. Yeah. And okay. I, I I find the intelligence from two thousand years ago stronger than the political machinations today. Thank you. That was a very nice answer. Uh, we have another question from the internet audience. Uh, Diana asks, do you think COVID will negatively influence architecture due to the lack of opportunities for students to get a traditional real-time education? We are educating our students by Zoom. And I believe that one of the things that's amazing is when I have a critique in our studio, I can have architects from all corners of the earth attend the critique. This is an amazing discovery because you're getting global intelligence bearing on a student's work. So I believe that if the student will be patient and take advantage of this new realization of Zoom connectivity, they'll realize that when all of this COVID thing is over, they might have had a better education because of it, because they could have more diverse criticism from many different minds. Another question, someone? So I'll go on with uh, another one from uh, uh, the Slido application. Uh, when you start a new project, what is most essential to you? I believe that seeing the site and feeling the, the, the natural light, the, the wind, the landscape, the context, the feeling of where it is, how the architecture could be building a, a meaning for the site is probably the most important thing. Um, but I do listen to all the programmatic aspects. Uh, if a client has many demands, I try to write them down. But I think the most important thing really is to have an inspirational idea that's about the poetics or the possible poetics of the site and the place. Oh, I maybe follow up with my personal question. At what moment do you draw your wonderful uh, watercolor sketches? Do you start with them or do you finish with them? No, no, I'm drawing them every day. I draw every morning uh, around 6 a.m. right at sunrise. And uh, I'm making many, many drawings. And I think the key is you have to be ready to throw several of them away and not become too attached. And uh, we have in our office, we now we do it on Zoom, but we have uh, critiques from everybody, everybody speaking about the different approaches. So there may be four, five, six, eight different approaches to a project in little tiny sketches. Uh, which I draw every day. I draw every day. And then we discover one has a, a spark of inspiration. Then we try to go further. We, we build some models. Then we have another critique. So it's a, it's a group dynamic between many people. And my wife here, Demetra Zacharelia, there she is, is the most important critic of all because she's the one that says, that's a winner or forget it, Stephen, throw it away. <laughs> it's a teamwork. <laughs> That's an important role yes. for the wife. I can't, you can't do it alone. <laughs> <laughs> 
Another one. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of students asking, uh, dear Stephen Hall, as a professor of architecture, if you would have to choose, what skills would you like to pass on to your students? Drawing. I believe that drawing is a form of thought. You know, <laughs> when, you, when you put together the synapses of your brain with, with, a, with a brush or a small pencil or a charcoal, whatever it is, and you make some conceptual diagram, you're, you're bringing together more forces that, that's in any computer. Why? Because you bring together a deep memory. No computer power has the memory that's in the capacity of the human brain. So conceptualizing a project, you have to begin with drawing. Even just a kind of diagram. I'm not talking about some kind of a rendering. You remember that? <laughs> um, another one. Uh, we regret that you cannot join us in Prague. Uh, if you were here this week, what is the one building or public space in the city that you would want to go and visit? Well, I was in Prague in 2004 and I went to see the house by Adolf Loos and I really appreciated that that day, the tour, because that, that, that Muller house has the essence of uh, Adolf Loos's work, the ROM plan, the spatial dynamics of a sectional shift. And it's something that you cannot photograph. So there's no computer rendering or photograph that can ever tell you the emotional energy of a ROM plan. So I would say that Adolf Loos's house is a must visit for anyone that goes to Prague. True. <laughs> um, obviously, the students are very much concerned about uh, sustainability. Uh, there is one, one question. Um, how can students of architecture see and learn from building in a flesh when they should reduce their CO2 footprint and travel less? That's a tricky one. Take a train. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. You know, when I came to Europe, I bought a Eurail pass in 1976 and I traveled to every Le Corbusier building in Europe. And one of the ways I saved money is I would take the Eurail pass. I had a kind of... Uh, a good class uh, Eurail pass. So I couldn't afford to stay in Paris. The, the cost was too much. So I would take the train from Paris to Lyon, get up at four o'clock in the morning and take the train back from Lyon to Paris. And that's how I spent my night I to, to save will, money. I believe there will be electric airplanes pretty soon. Yeah. I might try to give space to the audience again. Question there, Mr. Microphone. <laughs> Second row from the. There's a delay on this. Hello, uh, Esra Akin. Uh, it might be relevant with our student. Um, uh, I was, uh, I really wanted to hear uh, about your um, few, uh, pr previous attempts uh, in the context of uh, political uh, power. Uh, your thoughts for the future are very encouraging, except um, placing architecture as a weak profile confronting the political uh, bodies. Uh, have you ever tried to push political agenda for expanding the power of architecture? Let me say uh, one moment in my life recently at the groundbreaking of the Kennedy Center in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. It was 2012. 
and there were all the bodies, the Deborah Rudder, the director of the Kennedy Center, uh, Rose Kennedy, the granddaughter of JFK, but there was Joseph Biden, the vice president. And when, when he came to shake my hand after we put the shovel in the ground, he said, Stephen, you know, I wanted to be an architect. I said, Joe, tell me. He said, when I was running for Congress in 1970, I told my wife, if I don't make it, save the money up. I want to study architecture. I said, Joe, this is amazing. However, I would not trade you places. He laughed. Uh, we have another one here from the internet. I think I know who it is. It's our friend Joao. And he asks, or he says, amazing projects. Uh, I could find some affinities with some Caesar's design ideas. Is he a source of inspiration for you somehow? Absolutely. I, I was with Alvaro Cesar uh, two years ago on the 25th of July or, or near his birthday in Oporto. I gave a lecture in his school and uh, I spent two hours with him in his office. And uh, I said, I only came to give this lecture because they told me you would be here and I could see you. And then he followed me and sat in front of the whole lecture and watched it all. It was outside. It's a beautiful outdoor uh, like cinema. And uh, at the end of the lecture, he came up to me and he said, Stephen, the color you use, like Matisse, I'm <laughs> going to use color in my next project. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the other way around. <laughs> Um, I, if you allow me, I would ask one question from the conference. Uh, you might know that we have three panels tomorrow and on Friday, and uh, each of the panels has one question. The one, the first one tomorrow is, how do the new dimensions of our profession, meaning increasing scale and overlapping disciplines, impact our understanding of the role of the architect in society in the design process. Any thoughts on that? I believe that architecture is an art. So I'm totally not supporting the corporation of architecture. There's mo there are larger offices now than any, any time in the history of architecture. And I think this aspiration to have 250, you know, 200, 300 people in an office is really against the emotional reality of the experience of architecture. And so I, 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 I really feel that we have a kind of crisis, uh, especially in America, but maybe it's uh, international. And that is the, the corporate destruction of the emotional potential of architecture and the poetic potential of architecture. Destruct, destruction by capitalistic corporate uh, values. Okay, that was not very optimistic. <laughs> no, everything can't be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh yeah, please. that we all need in these times, the hope and the optimism that you were referring to. So I see joy in your work. Thanks. Light is the joy, it's the hope. Now, if you say we have to be watching for the scary part or like the scars, what would that be for you? And how would we avoid that part? The belief in the youth that the young people, the young architects, have the possibility to see the future in an optimistic way, ecological way, environmental way, a human way, and to understand that we have to listen to them and allow them the freedom to work as architects and not be strapped into a corporate structure 
that doesn't give them any freedom. When I teach a student at Columbia University and they can't work for me because I can't pay them the salary they need to live in New York and they have to go to work for a 300 person corporate firm and which they don't like the work, this is a big problem in architecture. So I see the thing that I would like to hope for is that there's more freedom for young offices and young people to start their own practices and believe in what they do and do it with the passion and the love that I did when I started my practice and not go to work for big offices and think that that's some kind of way. It isn't because you don't instill the love and the spirit and the passion in the work. Any other question? The lady here on the left in red. I think the biggest office in Greece is 33 people. Mm -hmm. That's, I should say. Okay, um, first of all, thank you also for, for the lecture. And um, speaking about this passion that you were just mentioning, um, I'm wondering always a little bit about the bubble uh, of architecture and how to get outside. And um, I wanted to ask you how we, how you would think we could, we can better communicate what architecture is about, and um, also why it is important. So um, to somehow transfer better the potential that is in there, but also awaken the will to learn, to read, and also to experience space. Um, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> so that's why I believe in architectural education. I'm a teacher uh, my whole life. And my wife and I, Demetra, we teach uh, two classes, one design, and the other one is called Architecture Apropos Art. And We love the teaching because I feel that we give the educational opportunity to each new student coming into the field. But I also feel that every, everyone that graduates doesn't have to become an architect. If you were teaching music, you don't need to think that every graduate would become a composer or a conductor. But the education of architecture is absolutely excellent because it, it touches on art and science and ecology, all these fields. And that's why it's a great education. And, and, and when people ask me, don't you think there are too many schools of architecture? I say no, because this is education in its multidisciplinary field. And it has also poetry in it which you don't get in a science education. Another one, if I may, which touches your uh, project here in Czech Republic. Uh, someone from the internet asks, Mr. Hall, thank you for your lecture. And I would like to ask what kind of sustainable technologies are you planning to use in the concert hall in Ostrava? We're using the maximum sustainable aspects. We have Matthias Schuler from TransSolar in Stuttgart, who has been with us for over 10 years doing many, many aspects of sustainability. So one of the aspects of this project will be geothermal heating and cooling, utilizing uh, some of the uh, existing mining structures below the site. And this is now being tested There's wells being drilled and, and different tests being made. So this may, it could possibly be the most sustainable concert hall built in recent years. One more question, and I think we should uh, uh, finish this wonderful evening. Uh, the question has something to do again with the topic of the conference. Uh, the conference is about overlapping disciplines, architecture, urban design, landscape architecture. And the question is, how should we incorporate this into education? We should feel that they're all intertwined. When I, when I graduated from the University of Washington, I went to San Francisco and I worked for a landscape architect, Lawrence Halpern. One of the reasons I did is 
I was educated by Richard Hague, a great landscape architect at the University of Washington. And he taught me things that I thought were more important than what the architecture professors taught me. So when I worked for Lawrence Halpern for four years in, land, in landscape architecture, I feel that I began to think about holistic beginning of every project, that the landscape, the urban, the urban form and the architecture are all intertwined. And if you can think about it from the very beginning of every project, I think that's the most positive thing. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much for... Thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to be there in uh, October for my, ex my exhibition opening in Ostrava. So I'll make another talk then. We will come for sure. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.